Welcome to episode three of the Fusion Podcast. In this episode, we continue with Dr. Dean's story. Dr. Dean heads up the Fusion Power Associates, the main advocacy group for Fusion in Washington, D.C. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Fusion Podcast. One of the goals of this podcast is to explain fusion research in plain English. So it seemed appropriate to wonder, what does the average person already know about fusion research? To answer that question, I went to a local public market on a warm Saturday morning. All right, at the public market. Dude, what do you think when I say the word physics? A class that I never wanted to take in high school. <laughs> Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Irene. What pops in your head when I say the word physics? Knowing how lift works on planes. What do you know about nuclear power? Honestly, it makes me think of Homer Simpson. Homer Simpson? Yes. Plus, I just bought donuts, so... How can you say about that? Because you have so many accidents with that. Okay, what do you think of when I say nuclear power? Just like power plants? I don't really associate it with anything like... When I say plasma, what do you think of? Blood. I think of a television. A television? A plasma television. What about plasma physics? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> no idea? Yeah. No idea? No idea. All right. What do you think about when I say nuclear fusion? What do you, what I don't do you... know about nuclear fusion. What is that? What is it? I don't know. Oh, it's when you take two little atoms and put them together. Yeah, and then what? You're talking about a big bomb. <laughs> That's right. It's a uh, need to be monitored. The way we are as humans, we do make mistakes. Communicating science is something that is extremely tough, even for experts to do. Personally, this was frustrating for me in graduate school. For example, the way that journal articles are written make them extremely difficult to decode, even for people who study the field extensively. Why can't scientific results be communicated more creatively? My second year of graduate school, I resolved to address this question. I started a blog to explain peer-reviewed publications in simple, plain English. With the blog, I attempted to meet the twin goals of accuracy and clarity. In fusion research, this is not an easy goal to solve, not even for Dr. Dean. We have a real problem with public relations, and I do think the big laboratories and universities do try, like Princeton and General Atomics and some of the large universities. They have outreach programs. They invite visits from high schools and so on, and they send their scientists out around to schools. They're not as good at communicating with reporters in the media. Probably not as effective. It isn't as effective as you'd like to be. Take a listen to this example that a reporter did with a plasma physics graduate student. You can definitely pick up some awkward exchanges. So you're getting a PhD in fusion energy? It's in plasma physics, which is the study of the material that we use to generate fusion energy. Okay, and what are we seeing here behind you? Uh, here we have the lithium tokamak experiment. So essentially, if you have a solid and you heat it up, you get a liquid. If you have a liquid and you heat it up, you get a gas. Well, if you have a gas and you keep heating that up, Eventually, you rip off electrons and you form a plasma. And that's the fourth state of matter. And that's the fourth state of matter. And this exactly. is the heat that is ten times the, the core of the sun? Or well, what happens is inside a plasma... You can hear how the reporter is grappling with this new topic. This is a small example of a larger problem that all fusion researchers face when communicating with the media. People just don't know much about nuclear fusion. This lack of knowledge becomes a real problem when dealing with policymakers in Washington.
We have a problem with getting the attention of the Congress or the public in a way that says that they ought to accelerate the program. What we've devolved into is a situation where we have broad support for a continuation of the program. Sort of an attitude developed that, well, fusion's a long way off, and every time people said it was going to be faster, it didn't turn out that way. Therefore, let's do it, but let's just take our time and go about it kind of a snail space. That's the situation we're in. Uh, the only thing that's demanding a lot more money and a lot more acceleration is ITER. Unfortunately, it's demanding a lot more money for a even slower schedule than what they were originally on. So uh, we don't have a horse to ride, if I might put it that way. The U.S. policy has been for maybe 15 years or more that we'll just do the science and we'll let the other countries do the engineering and the power plants. And once they've built the first one, then our industry will come in and steal all the technology and outdo them somehow. That seems to be the attitude. And that attitude is mostly driven by budget because they don't want to spend a lot more money than it would take for the U.S. to run an aggressive program. And it's partly driven by policy because with the present administration for the last eight years, the, the emphasis has been on the renewables and solar and wind, and the attitude has been that those are near term. We know they work even though they're not producing a lot of power, but uh, let's ride that horse. Now, when the Republicans were in, they were dominated by the fossil fuel industries, the, the coal industries, the gasoline, the oil industries, and the nuclear fission industries. And so, again, if they had their way, if they wanted to put more money into energy, which they didn't necessarily want to because their policy was cut federal spending because of the deficits. So the conservative basis of the Republican Party doesn't really want the government in the business of spending a lot of money on developing new energy sources. So we don't have a champion, I guess. We have support from both parties, but we don't have a champion in either. In my opinion, current federal funding for fusion is both low and lopsided. It's low because a lot of credible groups cannot get support. It's lopsided because most of the money goes to the tokamak. But what would be the ideal situation? I asked Dr. Dean to share his thoughts on this. Well, I think what has to be done is you have to get support for fusion, mostly from the government until it's a little bit closer to commercialization and you can attract private investment. But the only way I think we can get the government to uh, to do this is if you sort of take it out of the annual arguments over the federal budget, all of which always has a deficit. And one way to do that, I think, is to put a tax on a gallon of gas. And because of the very, very large billions of gallons of gas that are purchased every year, you would create a huge amount of money. And if you set it up so that all that tax on gas went into an R&D trust fund, just the way we have like the highway trust fund or the Social Security fund, but if you could do it in a way that didn't allow the Congress to come in and rob it every year, you would have surplus money to do everything that you wanted to do it and do it aggressively. So I think the financial situation has to be changed in that way in order to be able to get the money. And if that happened, I think there are a lot of people out there that would love to see energy programs across the board have Manhattan space program type uh, crash programs. I think they would create a great rejuvenation of the American spirit to do that. We did it for the atomic bomb. We did it for the space program, but we haven't done anything like that since. This tax idea was surprising. I am a millennial. I wasn't alive for the space program, and I barely remember the Cold War. When I think of innovation, I think of Google, and not the government. This lack of funding at the federal level has caused many people interested in fusion to go out and try and find private capital. To be sure, startups in fusion are not a new phenomenon. 
In this podcast, I plan to talk to many people who have worked or are working in private fusion efforts. Right now, the two leading startups in this space are General Fusion and Trialpha Energy. Between them, they've raised roughly half a billion dollars. I asked Dr. Dean what he thought about startups in fusion. The truth is that fusion is taking too long. And the Eater Tokamak project is too expensive and it's taking too long. And so, you know, there's room. And uh, there are, as you probably know, and in fact, I know you do know, probably a half a dozen or more of these ideas. Most of them are evolutions of things that are fairly old, that have been around for a while and were thought of early days and maybe dropped because we didn't know enough or didn't have the technology that people are revisiting. Some of these people have gotten private money, and that's great. There are possibilities out there that I think deserve to be pursued. Tralfa believes we have a path forward now to build the first fusion-based power plant. There is still work to do, but we believe we understand this well enough now to get there. This company has a single acute vision. So if the physicists want more magnetic field in a certain area of the vessel, man, the, the whole engineering and physics team swarm that vessel, get the machine back into operations. What we're doing in this machine is we're essentially rotating a plasma torus that's very hot and ionized. If you think of a top, that's exactly the mechanical analog to what goes on in here. If you want to stabilize that top, what do you do? You keep keep spinning it, right? And so we're feeding tangential energy in, and that creates a torque that keeps that object going. And the ultimate goal, of course, here is to do this sort of an operator will. If you didn't catch it, Trialpha's main concept is known as a field-reverse configuration. What is a field-reverse configuration? Well, plasma is pretty cool. You could call it a fluid that conducts electricity. That means it's controlled by the equations of fluid mechanics and electromagnetism. That means it can be moved by electric or magnetic fields. Moreover, it can generate its own electric or magnetic field. So it becomes possible to build semi-stable structures out of plasma. A good example of this is called a field reverse configuration. Basically, the plasma runs around like a donut. It's moving current, so it generates its own magnetic field. And that field self-contains the donut. What makes this so unique is that the plasma is being held up by its own self-generated fields. The FRC is great, but it's not very stable. In the late 90s, Trialpha came up with a way to stabilize the FRC. They basically fire particle beams along the edge to keep it spinning. In the 18th century, there was a game where kids would whack a hoop with a stick. This is basically what Trialpha is doing. The hoop is the FRC, and the stick is the particle beams. And in 2015, Trialpha set a world record for the longest stable large FRC ever created by mankind. Another large company in the fusion startup space is the company General Fusion. Their concept is known as magnetized target fusion. They start by making a semi-stable structure, like an FRC or a spheromac. Incredibly, they inject this into a chamber surrounded by spinning liquid metal. They then slam the liquid metal with a shock wave, which compresses the material down to a temperature and pressure where the atoms fuse together. In 2002, General Fusion's founder, Dr. Michel Leberge, reimagined an idea for fusion power that being afforded modern electronics and materials as well as advances in plasma physics he could build upon his predecessor's discoveries of magnetized target fusion in the 70s there were a machine called linus and that machine was a magnetized target fusion machine it was developed by the naval research lab in washington dc and in magnetized target fusion you make the plasma first which is not very dense and not very hot but then you compress it real quick when you compress it quick, it gets hotter and it gets denser. 
and then it gets hot enough and dense enough to make fusion reaction. In the last 12 years, General Fusion has grown to a team of 65 and become the world leaders in MTF technology. The company has made significant progress. Key subcomponents of its MTF system have been built at scale, including the world's largest plasma injectors. To be clear, both General Fusion and Tri-Alpha Energy are exceptions to the rule. It is really tough to create a fusion startup. I should know. I was involved in one. Right now, there are about a dozen private groups in America seeking funding for some fusion concept. To be sure, the majority of fusion research today is focused on the tokamak. And right now, we're in a situation where 90% of the scientists working in the world are all tokamak people. And so it's very hard now for these other ideas to catch on because one group or one person comes up with a good idea. He's not credible enough all by himself or the group all by itself to get funded. You have to have enough credibility and enough good arguments and physics basis to get other people to, to get on. You know, you need to get something to come out and then maybe two or three other universities jump on this bandwagon or a couple of laboratories or somebody else in another country. And you know, you got to have more than just yourself if you're an advocate. Otherwise, even if you got a good idea, you're not taken seriously if you can't convince a whole bunch of your peers to, to get on board with you. When it comes to energy, it's important to know where we are and where we're going. Today, roughly 80% of the energy consumed in the U.S. comes from a fossil fuel. That's where we are right now. Eventually, fossil fuels will run out and we will have to find a replacement. Predicting the future is hard, but I asked Dr. Dean what he thought about all this. For a couple of decades now, I've been wondering where's the next energy crisis? Because I went through the energy crisis in the 70s and a lot of analysis was done then by the economists and the energy supply experts who said, you know, we're going to run out of, of oil within 10 years. And here we are like 30 years later and we're not running out of oil yet. So it's very hard to say what is going to be the catalyst for the next recognition that we need to do energy R&D and develop energy sources aggressively. If there were another oil crisis in which we really couldn't get the oil that we wanted, that would probably shake everybody up and create this kind of an impetus. There really was a environmental catastrophe that was so bad that everybody recognized that you could blame it on global warming, then this would happen. The politicians would jump on their bandwagon, they'd be clamoring for all the energy they could get that was carbon free, and they'd throw money at it. Because I went through this in the 70s and I saw it happen. So, you know, I don't know when that's going to happen because I've been surprised over the last 30 years that it hasn't happened yet. One of the coolest recent developments in fusion research has been the growth of amateur fusion. High school students and middle school students can build small devices in their homes and garages and get nuclear fusion. I've interviewed a number of these people and they represent a good portion of this podcast. I asked Dr. Dean what he thought about this. I think these young people that we see doing various little projects that relate to fusion shows you that fusion still has the capability, the capacity to excite the imagination of young people that have a scientific event. They would love to get into fusion. And one of the things we've been doing the last several years in Fusion Power Associates is sponsor a group called the Coalition for Plasma Science. And one of the things that we've done as part of that is to give out science awards at these uh, science fairs. And it turned out that quite a few of the people that have won their plasma things were actually oriented towards fusion. The Division of Plasma Physics of the American Physical Society has an annual meeting, and for many years they've had Teacher's Day. And science teachers from the area where the meeting was being held were all 
contacted and invited to come for exhibits and things that were oriented towards students and to bring their class. And that's been going on for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. And that's one of the ways that the community as a whole has tried to get the high school level people interested. But the Department of Energy funded this mostly. And now in the past year, they've decided they're not going to provide money for that anymore. And this whole thing could die. And it shows you some of the short-sightedness in the government. For the very small amount of money it took to run something like this once a year for science teachers and high school science students, you know, that they couldn't find a little bit of money or felt that, you know, it wasn't worth their money to do this. So it's very disappointing. We're trying to raise enough money elsewhere to, to get this all done. But it is an example of how the, the government has really let the program down. Coming to the end of the interview, I asked Dr. Dean if he had any future plans for Fusion Power Associates. For 30 years, the FPA has been a wonderful resource for fusion research around the world. Did he have any plans to retire? And if so, who would take over once he had left? I have not given it a lot of thought because I'm still healthy and interested in what I'm doing. And I have a board of directors, about 20 people, and they're the heads of laboratories and major university programs. And it'll be their job to figure out what to do when it's time for me to retire. They're going to have to find a person to take over. When that happens, I think it'll somewhat depend on how Peter goes in the next couple of months or years. When I started Fusion Power Associates, my goal was to bring industry into the program. But when the U.S. didn't continue on with commitment to build new facilities here and provide opportunities for industry to get into the program, I lost the industry. So now my association is almost all... Uh, laboratories and university. If either is successful or if something else is successful and if there's a policy change to allow industry to actually get supported by the government, try to get some big industries really up to speed on how to do fusion, the government could do a lot of things to attract industry in, like cost-sharing things. And industries would come in. They don't want to come in and say, we'd like to do fusion, and then have the government say, well, we don't support industry. Okay, that's a fair answer. I think that's the last of my questions. Is there anything else you want to add? Well, just that I know that you've been very active with respect to the, the blogosphere, for lack of a better term. It shows that uh, someone like yourself that wants to interact with the young people that are perhaps more open-minded to how things might evolve than the people who've spent their whole life in one concept can gather a following. I appreciate your time to do this, and thanks for your hard work and your dedication. In next week's episode, we dive right in to amateur fusion. And instead of seeing a mushroom-shaped diffuse jet that is common to the Farnsworth fusion, we saw this shaft of plasma that was brighter than all the plasma that we had seen. I want to thank Mary, Irene, and Jim, Dr. Stephen Dean, and fusion supporters everywhere. Thanks.